<laughs> what happened? The jolt and about knocks you back, you know, and I didn't have it tight enough to my shoulder. No. Why were you firing the gun? Had an injured cat. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> My mom would shoot a gun. She'd uh, get us a pheasant once in a while. They'd come up around the house and she'd get a shoot the old pheasant. We'd have soup. <laughs> pheasant soup. <laughs> Matt and uh, did you guys ever watch the Ed Sullivan show by any chance? Yeah. Did you ever watch the Ed Sullivan show? All the time. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the performers on it? A lot of them. The what? The musical performers on the Ed Sullivan show. Do you remember them? No, I know. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, very few names. I uh, I can remember a, a nameless person. Do you remember when you first got your TV? Yeah, uh, we had a our little daughter after she was, well, when she was born, the uh, doctor said that she had never lived to be seven years old. And uh, she is the happiest little kid you ever seen. And uh, she'd run across the road to the neighbors. They had TV and, well, it was her uncles. And they'd watch TV. So my wife and I never had well, when we bought something, we paid <laughs> for it. But we never, but we saved enough money and bought the, a little TV so she could have TV to watch. Mm. I never got to see it very much. I was working at the hay mill. I'd work seven, seven uh, days a week, 12 hours a day or a night. I'd always work of a night. I'd come home across the field and pick up my old cow and come in and milk the cow. Fall of the year, I went to the, well, I milked the cow and ate my breakfast or supper or whatever it was. I went to work at the elevator and I would sack beans for four hours every day. And Didn't have time to watch TV. <laughs> yeah, we I, I run the automatic scales, and there's two other great big guys that I worked with. Well, there's uh, uh, well, they all stood six two and weighed probably two fifty, but I'd sack the beans and pick them up and set them on the sewing machine. I had an automatic scale. We had seven sacks a minute, 700 pounds a minute come off of that. And I'd pick them up and set them on the scales. The guy would sew them and throw them on the wheel cart. And the other big guy, he'd take them back and stack them. 10 high, the sack laying down. But I'd see him, he could just grab a hold of the top of a 100 pound sack and he'd bring it up like this and then <laughs> go up 10 high with him. <laughs> That'd be way higher than this ceiling. <laughs> yeah. I'm Patrick and Myra, I know you said you guys had gone to Wisconsin. Um, did you ever see a midget, you know, with the circus? Mid Michigan. Lake. No. no. Oh. Did you ever see a midget when you were in Wisconsin at the circus? Uh, yes, they always have uh, quite a few of those before me. <coughs> <coughs> they uh, have uh, a, what's it, a sanctuary for the hooping crane. 
it, and it's really guarded there and watched, you know, either. And it's known all over the United States about that. that. And that's in that's in Baraboo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right around, real close. Mm -hmm. Do you know where Delavan is? Do you know where Delavan is? No, that's I don't recall that. Okay. Do you have relatives there? Uh, I heard a story about. Oh how they used to winter there in Wisconsin and they're mm -hmm. marching an elephant across the ice on a lake and the elephant fell through. Mm -hmm. And so I just, that made sense that you said the circus was there. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Have you been to any circuit circuses recently? Have you been to circuses recently? No. And I want my children to see a real circus. It, it's just really something. Do they see, are they different, do you think? With all their high wires, <laughs> you do all the gasping. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd recommend it to any, just everyone to go and see it, young and old. <laughs> That's great. Thank you all very much. And so things like that. Put the old back. This isn't on camera. Is it? Yeah. Oh. But go right ahead. Tell us no, the story. No, said we're right. through with this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. I want to hear this story. I don't want to miss any of this. Well, it's just that we had to put a big bathtub in front of the cook stove. Phil probably with one of the youngest first, and that's the way they took a bath to the oldest. Keep adding hot water. That's the way we took baths. And Mom <laughs> insisted we take baths. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> And so you, your parents knew his parents? Is that, or you guys knew his parents? Well, yeah, I, I picked corn for his dad 50 years ago, I yeah, guess. A long time ago, yeah. <laughs> they, they left, uh, well, my uncle worked for his granddad. Uh, well, it's, uh, he come across it in the, from Russia, Odessa, Russia. My folks' dad was born there, and they come across, and my uncle never did get married, and he lived, uh, worked for his dad, or oh, for I don't know. Oh, how for many my grandparents. Years. Yeah, he he. How he, many years? Chris, his 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 uncle uh, did came and would stay five days. Right, he'd stay during the working week, and then he went to town. I think it was to take care of. That was uh, was it later on took uh, care later of, on took yeah. care of yeah. what was your aunt then at that point yeah uh, he went to uh, town to take care of his mother yeah his mother yeah so yeah. he would work on the farm during the week and then he would go in at the weekend to look after her but this was for a long time in the in the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties and uh, that was when everything was with horses entirely there were no no tractors all done by hand. And Floyd, you did a lot of work by hand, right? I mean, most of your life you did. Yeah. You know, there were no, no, no implements that weren't horse powered or hand powered. And that was tough. And we rode our horses to school. Yeah. And we took good care of them because we didn't want to walk. <laughs> <laughs> we rode horses to school. A mile and a half. And Two horses and six kids, three on each horse. <laughs> and otherwise, you walked. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and we're ready. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you uh, uh, talking about rattlesnakes uh, on uh, our bridles on horses. Uh, uh, you know, one rein was always with a snap, and uh, if the seen a rattlesnake but I got off and took that rain unsnapped it and killed a rattlesnake. Yeah. I remember <laughs> one time I was killing a snake and the come over and the snap was just right and it snapped into the snake and it couldn't get it loose and so we 
tied it onto the horse's tail and we went home. That old snake. <laughs> he is dead when we got home. <laughs> Will you kids have a good country? Take care. Of it. <laughs> Take care. Of it. We're bothering your class. No, ahead. no, this is, this is absolutely what we're here for. Exactly. <laughs> Snake stories. We like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to have your reactions and your the, what research you might want to uh, relate to us. And so, who would go first? Here's the stuff that. Talk, talk to me instead of the camera. Uh, my name is Kirsty Mark, and I'm going to talk about just the generic background of Weld County. Weld County is an area of uh, Greeley that, or northern central Colorado, that is area of about 4,000 square miles. It um, is bordered by northern Wyoming and kind of Nebraska area, and just north of uh, Denver metropolitan area. And it's one of the largest counties in Colorado. It's a generally dry climate with mild or mild with warm summers and mild winters and a good growing season. And it's um, there are 31 incorporated towns into Weld County, and most of the principal city is Greeley, where um, most of the population is living within a 20 to 30 mile radius of Greeley. And Greeley was actually started by. Um, uh, Nathan uh, Nathan Cook Meeker in 1870, which was an uh, immigrant who came over and had and had an idea of what he wanted to start with the Union Colony and a joint stock company to like build a community in this area, this farming community. Mm. And then, uh, then more immigrants came with him, and then Patrick can talk about that. Do you have any uh, c comments about uh, anything you learned today from? Well, it's just everything I learned was really fascinating today. How their stories started with a simple question, and so many anecdotes came from them, and what they really remember, and the great stories that from their life experiences that are just fascinating to me, and seem it's great to hear about them from a different community and a different time period that are almost lost on today's generation if they're not recorded and told and passed down. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Next. I am uh, Patrick McGlynn, and um, we just learned that uh, the German-Russian descendants came over uh, largely in part to the sugar beet industry, and it was the, uh, the Great Western Sugar Company <coughs> that brought a lot of these people over, and then, uh, you know, they came over with humble beginnings, and then they eventually you know, had uh, made enough of a, of, a, of a living for themselves to purchase their own farms and get into different industries like coal mining and uh, like Floyd was talking about, mm -hmm. uh, mining iron. And um, uh, just how the, the colonization of, of Weld County occurred uh, just by the influx of uh, Germans and Russians. Um, uh, like she said, it was founded by oh, Meeker in, uh, uh, in the 1870s when a joint stock company had come over um, from New York, I believe, and they had settled it with, you know, certain moral principles in mind and, uh, and uh, just a whole ideal for for living and such. Okay. Anything else you guys want to add today? All right. Who would be next? Um, I'll go ahead. Um, anthropologists conduct research um, in order to produce usually an ethnography, which is a book or an article that describes aspects of a particular culture. And um, um, some of these ethnographers ethnographies attempt to describe entire cultures and sometimes describe a single aspect of a culture. And this is a, this oral history that um, this interview that we've been conducting has, is a form of research that, um, that gives us the tools to describe the basic anthropologic or answer the basic 
anthropological <laughs> questions such as when, where, how do humans evolve, um, how do people adapt to changes, and that's what we've been attempting to do um, in this process by getting the, the memories and oral histories that you guys have to offer us, and it's so very valuable because this is history in the purest sense, and um, so much can be taken from an experience such as this because we get to hear firsthand and not just a textbook explanation of history. And it's eye-opening and very interesting and gives us a really good perspective on, um, <coughs> on you know, how this area in our, where we're from has evolved over the years. My name is Lindsay Lee, and as far as what we've done in the course so far, all we've really gotten to do is read ethnographies and watch videos in class of oral history. So today was a chance for us to do it on our own and see what it's really like to be out there experiencing only um, Luckily, we get to do it here, right on campus. So uh, we did experience an ethnography at home, and we had already read one of those. So it's nice to be able to relate that experience. And um, this really just let us see how hard it is to be out here and but how much fun it is and how important this will be and is right now. So Exactly. OK. I thought that this was just a great experience on Mad Mara. And I couldn't have expected anything more than what we got out of it today. I thought all their stories were just so interesting. Everything, it gives you just a greater sort of deep thought into how generations before us have come about their struggle and their problems when we don't have near as much as they did. And they just they just did it. They, they had no problem doing it. They got to their work. They did what needed to be done for their families. And I, it made me consider how lucky I am as compared to they were. I, you know, they're just working their fingers to the bone and we kind of take what we have for granted. But I think it makes our generation that much better that we can go out there and see where they came from maybe get our experience from them and record this because this is what anthropology is all about. I think that this was probably the best idea that we have for this course right now and it's taking us in a great direction. I love the stories about the rattlesnakes, the music back then, that was great. Um, the troops, that was really interesting. I had never heard anything like that. And mostly just the experience of their generation as compared to mine. I thought that that was the best part of the whole project. Very good. And, and thanks to Myra and Betty and Floyd. You guys were great today. Thank you. Yeah. And, and the point that you, just to amplify on that, is that, that your parents uh, all were here near the time of the founding of Greeley, 1870s. They weren't long, bef it wasn't very long before. They were here, just when Greeley was just a beginning. Mm -hmm. And so you, what you've had today is access to the memories of their parents. So you were actually able to travel in time, back to their time, and get a first-hand account, mm -hmm. which is uh, quite yeah. remarkable. My mother's father came from Odessa, Russia, because the Russians were, you know, taking the German young men into their armies, and they were not going to have that. So they came to, by ship to America. So they were fleeing from the German army? Well, they just got out as quick as they could so they wouldn't be drafted into the army. Thank you all.